Hey guys, welcome. This would be our uh, Sunday service. As many of you know, at least in our local family, we um, take off three times a year, quarterly, to let our staff relax and have family time and all that, just on our Sunday service. And But we still bring the Word of the Lord on a Sunday as we are now. And um, I hope this will bless you guys. I'm really excited. Uh, if you want to go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 7, Oh yeah, this is kind of our, um, really we shoot Zooms on here. This is at home, super simple, basic, but I thought it might bless you guys and be intimate, kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I want you to grab your Bibles if you can, and we're going to go line upon line from Luke 7. I'm excited for what I've been digging through and being challenged by from the Lord and pray to bless you guys. But yeah, this is where we'll, we'll typically shoot our Zooms with our third year students and things like this. And should should be good. So um, let's pray. Oh, yeah. Also, if you want to get communion, we'd love to take communion at the uh, end with you guys and believe for miracles in your bodies. Most importantly, a softened heart to love and know Jesus more. And um, it's going to be good. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, for this time together. Thank you for technology that we can even uh, meet with you in this way. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the inherent word of God, infallible scripture. Thank you for holy scripture, Lord God. Thank you that that even uh, the largest chapter in the word is about the word. Uh, Psalm 119, thank you that in the beginning you were the Word, and you were with God, and you are God. Thank you that you return under the title as the Word of God. Lord, I pray that your, thank you that your Word goes forth, as we see in Scripture, and heals them. Thank you that we're washed by the water of your Word. God, thank you for the Holy Bible. Let it come alive, and I pray, um, yeah, even now, that you'd help us get low, and like Isaiah 66 says, um, tremble at your word. And James 1.21 says um, that we receive the implanted word of God with meekness. Help us get under the word and become pliable and yield to it to become more like you for your glory. We love you. Uh, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Well, we'll jump straight in and... Um, excited and I, I, like I said I pray that this blesses you guys will be in Luke chapter 7 mainly verses 31 through 35 and this is a passage that I, I just saw recently like I had never seen before mostly all red letters I gotta remember to look into the camera sorry um, normally on these zooms I'm looking into my I think yeah computer at, at everybody but I'll do my best. Please be gracious with me. But um, mostly red letters here, meaning the Lord's talking in a beautiful just um, expression, I believe, that we see of the Lord. I love that he's this way. Um, he just he shoots it straight here. And I love that about the Lord. He's very um, kind, slow to anger, full of compassion, mercy. Um, but he also is truth. And 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love rejoices with truth. And I think sometimes we kind of, if we're not careful, we'll lean too heavy on the, the gray side or the candy-coated side, you know, of, of God. Um, or it can at least come across that way. But he's, he'll, he'll tell it like it is in, in love. And I appreciate that. And that's what he does here. And um, so the title of this is, I believe, going to say something along the lines of, uh, be justified by children or act like one. Um, be justified by children or act like one. And I, I pray that the Lord help us be like him. And I love that he often gives us windows in Scripture like this one where you can see what he's really trying to uncover in one sense but emphasize and highlight in the other that we may follow him better and become more like him. You know, and he does it quite well here, of course, perfectly as always. But let me read through. Let's start back in 29, please. And we'll go verse uh, Luke 7, 29 through 35. And then we'll just dig into it together. Go literally line by line, sometimes word by word. 
I love that often. So this will be like an intimate Bible study and hope it blesses you guys. And, and I hope we all just continue to fall more in love with the Word of God and the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and be changed into His likeness and image. But um, I'm in the New King James Version. English Standard will read similar, you know, whatever version you, you have. But starting in verse 29 of Luke 7, it says this, And when all the people heard him, capital H, talking about Jesus, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him, not having been baptized by John. Verse 31, and the reason I read 29 and 30 is I feel sure that it's almost what the Lord uses to segue into verse 31. You can see he almost, this is where he pivots and springboards from to then jump into this beautiful passage we're going to really stay in for the whole remainder of this time. But verse 31, And the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you. You didn't weep. Verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, as a demon, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. <clears throat> and this is so, so good. Thank you, Jesus, um, because I believe if we will look at it, hopefully, through the eyes of the Spirit, with the ears to hear, the Lord can take us higher, you know, into um, Christians, Christ-like ones that are becoming more in His image, more um, into His His likeness and image. And um, But why I first want to bring in verse 29, and then we'll just kind of slow down and go, go line upon line together. Um, we won't have the lower thirds like we do through our live church services. So if you can just follow me in your Bible. But why I want to touch on verse 29 first is <clears throat> because I believe the Lord uses verse 29 and 30 to, to then say what he's going to say. And I feel like it connects and he can pull some little keys from it. But back to verse 29, and when all the people heard him, Jesus, and, and real quick just to, give us context just before this jesus is giving the praise of john the baptist kind of a synopsis on who he was what he did why he came and um the profound call upon his life the messenger spirit of elijah's on him you know all this the forerunner of jesus christ himself and then it says and when all the people heard him jesus talking about this even the tax collectors justified god having been baptized with the baptism of john because that's what the Lord was just talking about. In this key, this verse is key. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So before we get into the main passage, this is such a helpful, um, some helpful nuggets to help us like, oh yes, Lord, um, may you not walk again to, you, to myself, you and I, our family, both locally and across the world online, I'm watching and say, to what shall I like in this generation? Because I, I feel sure the Lord would walk the earth today and say this very same thing, but even much more so. And there's plenty of scriptural proof, um, proof for that. But this verse 30 where it says, you know, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected it. Just prior, though, all the people that heard him justified God. E in the Bible it goes out of its way to say even the tax collectors, who typically probably had a a leaning towards money, you know, collecting finances and, and mammon, mammon probably being their god, or could likely lean that way. But at least they could be bent by their perception of God and what is right in the eyes of God. While yet it says, but the Pharisees and lawyers basically wouldn't move. It says they rejected the will of God for themselves, having not been baptized by him. And the Lord said, to what shall I liken this generation? You see that connection, verse 30 says, but the Pharisees and lawyers didn't. 
And then right then in verse 31, Jesus kicks in saying, what shall I liken this generation to? You know, you can see the connection causing us to slow down and be like, wait a minute, what was it about the Pharisees and lawyers that we don't want to run in tandem with from within, from a heart posture, you know, and become parallel or like unto. So Pharisees and lawyers, um, sorry, one second. Um, Pharisees and, and lawyers speak of, obviously, number one, Pharisees. They were like the elite religious order of the day, the pharisaical view. Paul was a Pharisee. That You had a few that got converted in the days of the Lord, but most of them basically were the religious hierarchy, the you know, I, I would liken them to being under the perception that they were the top of the top in the religious field of that day, which made it tough because there was little you could tell them if it didn't already fit into their box of what they thought they knew and how their heels were dug into their, you know, predominant disposition on what God was and what was just and true and what what um, deity looked like and in, in the order thereof. And then you think lawyers, why were they thrown in, the, in there? They're very similar, can be. We, we know there's some very God-fearing lawyers in the earth and thank, thank the Lord for them. But also that field, if not carefully you know, um, submitted into the fear of the Lord, can typically lean towards they will also dig their heels in on one notion in whatever thereafter to win that that case, if you will. Sometimes, whether for the right or the wrong, once they lock into something, they're not going to move unless it's they win for from their disposition, their ideology, their take on it, or whatever. And so, these similarities you see with Pharisees and lawyers that basically, if it doesn't fit their mold, they're they're not going to bend to it, which is um, very detrimental because. What that would look like to you and I is somebody that's very becomes very strong-willed, um, lacks pliability, lacks yieldedness, no longer moldable in the hands of God. It look it's religion quite often as well because often it looks like this where the Word of God you already come into the Word with this predetermined disposition that has to fit your narrative. And if it doesn't fit, if it comes looking like a man in a hairy camel um, suit <laughs> eating wild locust and, and honey and wild man, John the Baptist, uh, baptizing people in water, talking about a man coming that's going to baptize in fire and and the Holy Spirit, that, that doesn't fit your narrative. And it, it's got to check off on my boxes. And that's why I love it. It says, all the people heard Jesus and justified it, being baptized by John. But it says the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves. There's another key there. It says they rejected the will of God for themselves. And I believe you can even see that twofold. Like, nah, that's not for me. Or also rejected the will of God for me because uh, I'm more important for themselves. Like I'm what I will and how I think it ought to be and how it, it should play out. Um, even my uh, status, I would have to give up to then submit to that. And, and I'm more important to me than the will of God. So they reject the will of God for themselves. And it starts giving you great indicators right out of the gate that they are their number one, that their will is their God. And this, I pray the Lord would help us. And, and he does so beautifully starting in verse 31. He helps us go, oh my gosh, yes, help me run from this and become like Jesus, which looks like wisdom that then is justified by all her children. And um, But back to that point of Pharisees and lawyers, typically what that would kind of display to you and I is somebody that becomes very, they kind of dig their heels in and become immovable in a, in a bad way. They're, they're no longer pliable clay in the hands of the potter. Our father from Isaiah 64 Eight, I think it says, um, God, you are our father. You, you are the potter. We are the clay. Well, when you start to t 
take on the disposition, this predetermined, this is how it is, this is what I know, I'm the hierarchy, pharisaical, know it all of the day in this religious sect and order, you know, then you know, nobody can tell you anything. You, you, you're right, everybody else is wrong. And then that lawyer slant as well, it's very similar. It's like, nah, this is what I'm battling for. And right or wrong, this is my case, and I'm, I'm sticking to it, and I'm going to build every case to win, and I'm not moving. And that's very detrimental because you no longer um, are in the posture of clay in the hands of the potter. He, he can't mold you. You're not moldable anymore. And typically when this is the case, God's got to break people before he can, can even start to build anything in them or through them and mold them because they're not moldable. So he has to break them first, moisten them up again by the word, the water of the word and the spirit, put them back on the wheel, start over. And so I think that's really key to see that then, you know, that then causes the Lord to say to what then shall I like in this generation? Because you have these two images here in the Pharisees and lawyers that reject the will of God for themselves because their will, their status, what they believe, how they've already dug their heels on or what they know and how they know more than everybody else, you know, they're, they're not pliable. And so then the Lord says, verse 31, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We mourned to you, you didn't weep. John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. So he's still talking about John the Baptist. He, he's still bringing in the thread, is still sewing through the fabric of this paraphrase or this, this, um, this uh, passage from before where he's talking about John the Baptist, but nevertheless, he has a demon, son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton, a wine bibber, friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom is justified by all our children. So back to 31, the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? And I love this. Watch this. This is, this is the side of the Lord we quite miss often. We miss quite often. He will say it like it is Peter, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. You've got the mind of man. And you never saw him say, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter, was that, was that a little too much? Did that hurt your feelings? No, he, he was filled with Satan in the moment because of the mind of man, and he just called it like it was, and then he moved on. You know, the rich man that came to him, what must I do to be born again? He says, sell all. He knew what was in his heart. His riches were, had his heart. So he says, if I can get that, I'll get you. Sell all, give to the poor, follow me. The guy left sorrowful. You never saw the Lord. Well, it's okay. I tell you what, let's just start slowly. You know, just give a little until your heart becomes more pliable and you can give fully. No, he let the man walk away. You see where the Lord says, hey, they, they said, let me bury my, my father before I can follow you. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. He's the most loving man on planet earth and ever was. He is the thing. He is love. But I think we it would behoove us not to get it twisted either. He's truth. He's truth. And, and that's what we need. He's righteous and just, and he, he's altogether lovely, too perfect. And this is where he comes in right here. And it's, it's not condescending, it's just truth. He's not condemning, it's just truth. It's not slander, it's just truth. So to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? You can just imagine. And what are they like? He says, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like children. And let's stop right there. That, that right there is, whew. he's basically saying they're acting like kids. They're immature and self-centered. And he says, what shall I liken the men of this generation? Um, this passage also you can overlap and see in, in Matthew 11 if you kind of want to dissect it and, and you kind of pit them against each other, no, for each other, overlap them. So in Matthew 11, he says, "What to what then shall I liken this generation? He just keeps it broad. And, and then in this, Luke 7, he says, what shall I liken the men of this generation? But nevertheless, it applies to mankind, humanity. And he says, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like children. They're like kids. They're immature and self-centered. That's what he's saying right out of the start there. Um, you know, we know this, that, that that's just, you, you ever, have you ever seen a baby crying and screaming and crying because their parents didn't get to eat their lunch? You know, I know that sounds a bit absurd, but I'm, I'm making a point that 
the babies cry because they're hungry or they cry because they need their diaper changed. They're very, it's, it's just a human nature is all we're all, we were all this way. And that's the beauty of what the price Jesus paid for. And if you're a believer to then yield your life unto the Lord, we, we are trying to, to go deeper and deeper into Jesus, which looks like a life that is, ends up being, ends up having to, to be a little bit to almost nothing about us. You start as a child born in sin, you know, and that sinful nature is very, is very self-centered. It's all about us and my needs and me. And this is what children are like. Understandably so, they don't know any better. It's, it's the, the sinful nature of man. But this is when the renewed mind and the yielded, unto, yielded life unto what the Lord has paid for does. We start to realize like Philippians 2. And we start to count it all joy to lay our life down. And we realize Jesus left all deity to lay his life down for others. And so on a separate note, this is how you can start to tell maturity in the life of a believer. When, when this world becomes less and less about you. That's one of the dead giveaways of a mature life in God is this life, the preeminence is him and second in line is others. And you you start to become nowhere in the equation. It, it's, it's really special. And so for the Lord to say they're like children, he's basically saying the reverse. He's saying, they're, yeah, they're men, but no, they're really children. And this life's all about them. And they're immature. They're children. They're, they haven't matured yet. And they're self-centered. You know, babies, when they cry, they they don't cry because they're sad their parents didn't get to eat. They're crying because they want food. It's about them. And we get that, and it's precious, and it's, it's such as life. But if we're honest, it's it's the sinful nature we're born into. And thank God as believers in the price that Jesus has paid and the spirit he's given, we can go into the new covenant and, and leave that sinful nature and go into the nature of Christ. But nevertheless, the Lord's saying, they're like children. I mean, he, he hit hard right out of the gate. He, he didn't mince words. He didn't try and candy coat it or pat it tactfully. He just called it like it was. He says, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like children, immature, self-centered. Then he says, if you're reading still with me in verse 31, um, sitting in the marketplace. Let's stop right there. Sitting. That, so you got to realize, you know, the Lord, he's very calculated. He goes, and he says it twice. To what then shall I liken the men, the men of this generation and what? Are they like? And so when you hear him say that twice, like, what should I liken them to and what are they like? I'm about to really expound is what he's saying. Pay attention. They're like children. Right there, you stop and go, oh, wow. He's bas he's calling it as it is. They're very immature and self-centered. They don't know yet about how wisdom actually has children and raises them and cares about others. They, they're still in the immature state of caring about them. And... um and then also they're sitting. You notice that that's a key word, meaning they're unproductive. And, you know, in, in God, it's, it's, it's sad often, but in this first part is beautiful because it's the uncovering side, you know, to what we want the light bulb to go off in our own life and be like, oh my gosh, yeah, I have had these tendencies, you know, no condemnation, Jesus loves us, but let's not stay there. Let's go to the ladder that the Lord highlights at the end of wisdom. And, and another um, reason I love this passage is it's another one where the Lord um, shows a clear distinction, a stark difference between wisdom and, and uh, foolishness. And he does this often. You know, the, the wise builder and the foolish builder, the wise virgins, foolish virgins. Um, Proverbs, lady wisdom, lady folly. And here he does the exact same thing. He's basically saying, this is the foolish ones of this generation. But at the end, I'll tell you what wisdom looks like. And you and I want to leave the foolishness and go to wisdom, becoming like he who is wisdom, Jesus. But he says, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like children, immature, self-centered, sitting, which speaks of being unproductive. In the eyes of God, often people are doing a whole lot of Martha type things, but in God's eyes, he's like, they're just sitting there. 
I don't I don't see any productivity. And and this is where we really need the Lord to help us because children, in a sense, not literal ones that are a gift from God, we know that, um, but from this context of this passage, he's saying they're immature, self-centered, and unproductive. And they're, they're sitting there. They're not, there's no movement. There's nothing going on. There's no, it's stagnant and stale. There's no life. Um, anything they think they're producing, I promise you, it will come up before me one day as wood, hay, and stumble, uh, stubble. And the fire of my eyes will burn it. It'll test it, what, that which is real love. But wisdom always brings silver, gold, and precious stones. And they're, they're never, wisdom doesn't sit. It's productive uh, in, in about the will of God. But sitting, that one's real key. So, so far we've got immature, self-centered, and unproductive. And this is what the Lord's. just so you know, I, I feel for sure he would scan this generation and say the same thing, if not probably double down on it, you know, because Second Timothy 3 says, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. Selfishness is at an all-time high and only increasing with the darkness of the earth. Men will be lovers of themselves, boasters, proud, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And that falls right in here. When he says that, when he says they're like children, that's what he's saying. He's saying they're self-centered, immature. And I, I love that in 1 Corinthians 13, true love that God is, he is the substance, says that love seeks not its own. True love is never about itself. It does not, it's not self-centered at all. You know, that's why I, I, I joke about this with our, our family, but I say, why do you think the Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself? Because he knows how well we already love ourselves, it's it's like in us. So he's saying, "Hey, you know how you do that so well? <laughs> you should love yourself so much. Can you please do that to your neighbor?" It's kind of a funny way to look at it, but help us, Lord, leave this self-centered way of man. It's not like Christ. Love, true love, the Bible says, lays its life down for another. It prefers others, and um, but immature self-centered, unproductive. And where are they sitting, Lord? In the marketplace. Look look what that word in uh, Greek means. It means public place of assembly, the most frequented part of a city or village, meaning this is what else they do. They make it their point to go to the most trafficked area of mankind because they always it's all about them. They want to make the most of them being seen and heard very Self-centered because they're so important and they're so right and they must be heard. And um, they, they're very intentional about sitting in the marketplace. You know, this is why, this is why the Lord used this, this analogy. And so right away he's saying immature, self-centered, unproductive, and they post up in the most prominent areas to be seen. You know, um, he even says that with the religious that, um, love to pray on the street corners. He says, don't, don't pray like the, the Pharisees and the, the religious that love to be seen by men. When you pray, don't, don't, don't pray like them that love to stand up. It actually says stand up, stand to be seen high so you're not hidden in the crowd, and on street corners where there's two roads meeting, more, more chances to be seen. And it's about them. And I am so important, my take on life, my perception, where I'm at, what I'm doing, me, me, me. And uh, I'm not moving. I'm going to reject the will of God for myself because my will is more important than how I see it. You know, and that's what he's saying here. So in the marketplace, and listen to this, if you read further, he says, and calling to one another. This is a major key right here because if you if you read that very closely, it says they're calling to one another. He says, what, what is the, what, what I liken the men of this generation to? He's like, I tell you what they're like. They're like kids. They're just mere children, man. They, they don't grow up. They're immature, very self-centered, um, super unproductive. They make they're they're very intentional about being seen and heard and going to the place where, you know. And, and we got to be careful with all this, man. I'm, I'm telling you, um, we got to be careful, even through the means of of today that we have at our fingertips. And sometimes we. We think God is in things 
that it's just the wrong spirit fueling the, the why of what we're doing. I'm trying to be as generic as possible, but help us, Lord, to be those that seek to be unknown. We're, we're not looking for marketplaces. We, we want to be known by God. We want to know Him and He know us. And we want to be mature. And we want to be selfless and not sitting, productive, work while the day is at hand for the will of God unto His glory. Like that. That's um, where we're heading. May it be so of us, Lord, I pray. Um, help us, Jesus. But uh, calling to one another, you know, you'll notice here that if you, if you see the picture, he says, look, they're like kids. They're super immature, self-centered, unproductive. They always make it a great focus to go where everybody's at so they can maximize the, their being seen or heard because they think they're right and know everything. And, and they're, you know, they always reject the will of God because their will is their God. <clears throat> but if you're not careful, you may be fooled into thinking they walk with God because they have the Pharisee hat on. And they, they know the verses, and they'll even prophesy to you. And, and, and they're so warped by their own deception, there's a real passion behind how they say it, when they say it, and the verses they quote. And so if you don't have spiritual maturity, you may be fooled by them and think that they are religiously deep. He goes, but I'm just telling you that they reject the true will of God because their will supersedes his. And they ha they're they very um, um, immovable in, in a bad way. They're not moldable, pliable, yielded, not humble. They don't tremble at the word because they, they cherry pick the word and make it say what they already believe it should say. This is religion. It goes at the word and with the predetermined disposition, and it must fit what they, versus James one twenty one, that says we receive the word with meekness, meaning we get under it, and we say, "Change me, Lord, help me, help me yield and become pliable." O Father, you are the Potter; I'm the clay. Please let me be moldable. Have your way, you know. Um, but calling to one another, he's saying they're they're children. You know, I went through all that. Immature, unproductive. They love to seek out places of being seen. That's that's because when they think they're so special anyway. And they, but listen to this. This is a profound key. They call to one another. It, if you look at that close, it doesn't say they just call out to the people in the marketplace. They actually go into the marketplace, but then it, they end up just calling out to one another. The children, the men of this generation that are not childlike in faith, childlike by, by immaturity and self-centeredness. And so you have a group over here that cries out, if you can picture it, we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. They're calling to one another, the Bible says, Jesus says. This group says, oh, yeah, we mourned to you, and you didn't weep. And they just end up going back and forth in their unproductivity, unproduct self-centeredness, um, and immaturity, and one reason they, they, they call to one another is because wisdom won't give them the time of day to listen to them because they know they're invalid. Not out, not out of disrespect or dishonor. They just Wisdom recognizes wisdom, and wisdom also recognizes foolish and doesn't play around with children. N number one. Number two, they're not there. They're not in the marketplace trying to be seen. They're busy about the will of God, laying their life down for others for his glory. They don't have time to, as soon as they hear like, wait, hold on, or they see self-centeredness, um, unproductivity, and everything, and what they'll always say is, we did, you did not. This is the generation of foolishness the Lord's uncovering and just hitting with a sledgehammer of truth to then highlight at the end what wisdom looks like, and it's beautiful, and that's the direction you and I want to go. Lord, help us leave this area of immaturity, self-centeredness, foolishness, and go unto the wise camp that looks like Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, <clears throat> and so many more. But this is typically what they'll do. They are, and this is another thing. They always think they did something so special, and you did not. Everything is, I did this great, you did not. I know better, you don't know. I'm right, you're wrong. Um... And you see this so clearly later where Jesus says that, look, John the Baptist came doing this. They said that. I came doing this. They said that. They're always right. You're always wrong. 
they're always the victim. You're always the victimizer. Um, they did something special. Everything they do is amazing. Everything you do is not doesn't fit and doesn't work or it's not good enough. And this is how you can indicate foolishness. It's it's all rooted in immaturity, self centeredness. It, it's not pliable, teachable, correctable. It knows everything it, and everything it does, and it's it's got a very deep root of pride because it can't be corrected. It already knows better. And everything it does is great and checks off as right. Everything you do is bad and wrong. And so I love that it says calling to one another, though, because it shows you that they're the only kind that listen to each other. That's why they have to call to one another because they're the only caliber people that will even take the time to listen to each other because wisdom has no time for it. Wisdom will recognize it in 0.2 seconds and move on. Falling in love with Jesus for the glory of God, busy about the Father's business. You'll never hear foolishness calling out to wisdom and wisdom jumping into the conversation. Wisdom just lets its children justify itself. I love that too. You'll see nowhere in here where Jesus says wisdom says anything. Wisdom lets its children talk for it. Children talk, uh, there's a lot of noise, but little to no fruit because they're sitting. There's no productivity. There's nothing around of any weight eternally. And But it thinks it is the hierarchy of the day, the pharisaical, you know, or lawyer, I'm right, and lawyer stance. And so I love this. Again, this passage is so beautiful because the Lord's coming in with a sledgehammer of truth on foolishness and pulling the rug out from under it and then putting an incredible gold bar on wisdom and showing us the difference between the wise and foolish builder or the wise and foolish virgins and and those in this generation that are like unto children versus the wise ones that would look like those who follow Jesus. So anyway, they call to one another. This is another thing there too you can find there is that they typically find each other as well. Isn't that wild? In the busiest place, most frequented in any city or village, they still are able to call to one another out of all the people, the passers by and everybody going and coming. They tend to find each other, which is really interesting. And then also they're the only ones that will actually listen to each other. Because wisdom will expose them. Wisdom recognizes it and won't give them the time of day. Not out of disrespect or dishonor, just out of why. Like, why why would I waste my time in a world of wood, hay, and stubble that's all going to burn up in self-centeredness, spiritual apathy, lukewarm, know-it-all pride, you know, unable to correct and teach, no pliability, yieldedness. No, like that, nope. Wise runs with wise. The Bible says... Very clearly, to, if you hang with the wise, you'll become wise. You hang with the foolish, and great destruction will come upon you. And so, um, and I'll, I'll start to land it here in a second, but we played the flute for you. You did not dance. We mourned to you. You did not weep. It's typically come from that standpoint. Like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm right. I don't know what. I, I, I just did everything great, and they did something wrong. And, and because everything's I, 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 me, 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 immature self-centeredness. Help us, Lord, leave this. Help us become a lowly people that come under the yoke of Jesus and learn to be gentle and lowly like him and not stuck stuck in in pride and and selfishness and things that just, they really trench you out in immaturity. You can't grow there, you know. Verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon— The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Um, I'm wondering if I should go here quick. Um, Yeah, let me say this quick, because some people say that I just think it's it's help, helpful. I've touched on this in the past, but um, you know where people say that Jesus was a friend of sinners. I get it, and He loves everyone, and He would that all that none would perish, all would be born again. He He, he um, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and and um, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And 
We leave the 90, 99 to, to um, find the one. But the, the term, just in, from a scriptural sake of context, where Jesus was a friend of sinners, is in the same rebuttal of he was a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So that people use that verse, and it's like, man, that, that was actually the, the, the phrase Jesus used that the, from the immature, the foolish ones that were saying about the Lord. And I love that James, the book of James is very clear. It says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And we are not to, you know, align ourselves with the counsel of the wicked. This is all throughout Scripture. So Jesus wasn't a friend of, of sinners. He loved them, in, in, but constantly when he would uh, meet them where they were at, he would tell them, repent, go and sin no more. So I just think that's helpful. That's a kind of side note. But that phrase that Jesus was a friend of sinners gets pulled from actually a false you know, accusation from foolish ones that Jesus pulls. And James is clear, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I just think it's real key that we, we know that. And while yet we love the lost and seek to save them through what the Lord has paid for, of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, but, uh, you know, there's, that Jesus wasn't a friend. Um, actually, Hebrews 1, 9 and Psalm, Psalm 45, 7 says, He loved righteousness and hated wickedness. He loves sinners and he loves the wicked, but he hates wickedness and he won't befriend anything of its kind. You know, um, even the love of this world is um, is not from the Father, uh, John says. And so I just think that's a helpful balance. But um, down to the last verse, though, verse 35, this is the gold bar that you and I want to, to lean on, on to. It says, but wisdom is justified by all her children. He spends four verses bringing a sledgehammer of truth against foolishness and just drops one gold bar on the last verse for, for um, wisdom and what it would look like and where you and I need, need to go. And um, all springboarding from the Pharisees and lawyers that rejected the will of God for themselves strong-willed people that think they know everything that are not pliable, teachable, correctable, and, and their, their self-will and interest supersede the will of God. And so we need that to, we need to leave that, help us Holy Spirit leave that, because when you, you get, when you dig your heels in there and get stuck in that state, it's very hard to enter into wisdom where understanding is also. That's another point I would like to point out is when you're immature, self-centered, unproductive, you, you come into a prideful disposition that's, that's rooted in deception, and it's very hard to see it. You're convinced that you did and they did not. You're convinced that you're, you know, you know more, they're wrong. You, you're right, you know, whatever it may be. You're the victim, you, you know, whatever. And wisdom sitting here going, I don't even know what you're talking about. Wisdom walks by. It's funny. Wisdom, I can imagine the Lord nowhere near the marketplace, you know, telling them, saying, I'll tell you what the men of this generation are like. They're like immature little kids. They act like kids. They don't grow up. They're very self-centered. They sit and don't do anything. They want everybody to recognize them and do everything for them. And guess where they sit in that marketplace over there that I typically try and bypass unless I'm going to destroy the works of darkness but I'm usually slipping through crowds trying to not be seen and telling people, don't tell them I'm the, the Christ and telling demons to shut up and don't tell them, you know, my time is not year, not ne not yet near seeking to be unknown. And, um, wisdom similar, it, it, it walks by and it's like, did I hear a flute? I thought I did, but it was, it was faint because I'm, I'm moving. I'm productive. I'm following the cloud of God. I'm, I'm following the pillar of fire, if you will. I'm, I'm, I've got somewhere to go. I've got to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm taking up my cross and denying myself and following him. It's not about me. And it, wisdom hears the faint noise of a flute and the complaints and how right they think they are, but it typically doesn't even know what you're talking about. It's too busy obeying God and doing its best to, to adhere to the Lord for his glory 
And then what do you know? There's children from that. And that's how it's justified. There's actually, there's actual fruit. And then all of a sudden the children are like, you didn't hear my flute playing. It's like, I thought I did, but what were you talking about again? I don't even know what you're, you're sitting in one spot and you're focusing on you and poor little old you. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't even understand your whole world. Like, what, what are you, what are you stuck in again? Because I, I've got to follow the lamb, you know, and I pray that's how you and I would be. We just get over the, in, I didn't know I was going to go here, but this life's number one, all too short, but now the time is short. You know, I was just in James chapter five the other day. It's beautiful. He says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And it jumped out like I'd never seen before. I'm telling you um, to those with ears to hear, and I'm talking to me always, we must establish our hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We are nearer than ever before. We know that. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but this is not the time to be stuck in the shallow temporal things that revolve around you and I. This thing is about him and his preeminence and others. That's got to be the priority. Love God, love others. Then wherever we fall out, out in that great, and typically the reward is, is far greater for those anyway because it's just the kingdom protocol and alignment, but where I was going to get to earlier is um, ch- the children of foolishness, th- there's little to no understanding there. And that's why there's no wisdom, because in Scripture you will always see where wisdom is, understanding is. They, they're they like peanut butter and jelly. They they run in tandem. They, they thrive off of each other. And what understanding is, if you really break down that word, it's to stand under the situation, meaning you can see it from the very foundation all the way through. You see all the layers you fully understand. It can also mean to stand between two um, realities and connect them to where you have the, you have the whole um, perspective on it all. You understand you, you can connect both. Well, children, they only see their side and it's very um, tunnel focused because when you're self-centered, and immature, you can't see clearly anyway. You see right before you, and all you see is your problems, your worries, what you, what all you do amazing, and nobody else notices, and all this. And you have little to no understanding. And when you don't understand, you can't see rightly, make correct judgments and decisions. You can't hear God clearly. And uh, wisdom is nowhere to be found. Understanding is always with wisdom. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Um, you'll see wisdom and understanding with Solomon when he prayed. He actually prayed for understanding, and God gave him wisdom with it. If you really slow down in Scripture, he didn't pray for wisdom. He prayed for understanding. Nevertheless, it's a whole other um, teaching. But when, we, when we're immature and self-centered, you, you don't understand. You're very lopsided. And I pray for a spirit of understanding to come upon us to where we'd walk in wisdom and all of a sudden that starts looking like, oh my gosh, yeah, I, I forgot about me a long time ago because I'm so fixated on Jesus Christ, his wounds, his love, his eyes, his grace, his mercy on my life. His voice is so fresh every day. I can't live without it. And I'm just trying to do my best to do what his voice says. That's those wise builders that do what he said. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? A wisdom obeys really, really well. Oh, yeah, and, and that's what I want to point out. I love that verse 35, there's gold bar. There's so much there in that last gold bar, by the way. Jesus brings a sledgehammer of tr- truth on the first four, four verses in demolishing folly. But then this gold bar, he says, but wisdom is justified by all her children, not one of hers, all of hers and her. I love that in this picture and mostly throughout Scripture, wisdom is predominantly um, seen as as a female, her. And real quick, I love that it's her, singular. While as they, in this generation, typically the the immature self-centered ones, just so you know, they're out there by the masses and they're in the marketplaces and seeking to be known. Wisdom comes down to typically a needle in a haystack, her, one person. It sounds like one person. So they, the masses, the, the men of this generation, a very broad statement, and then wisdom and her, singular. You know, they're, they're, 
they're so valuable and few and far between. And I pray, Lord, help us by your spirit and your word. Help us go there. Help him walk by us and be like, oh, my gosh, there's there's a wisdom. And look at all her children. Look at Jessica and all her children. That's wisdom right there. Look at Stephanie, um, Timothy, Nathan, you know, whatever. Um, let the Lord walk by us and be like, yep, there they are. That's the ones I was talking about. They're super rare. Keep your eye on them. Look at Nathaniel. He has no guile. No guile. But the men and women of this generation, let me tell you, just go, if you want to run into them here and there, just go find a marketplace nearby because they'll be there. They think they, they are the best thing since sliced bread, and everybody needs to hear what they have to say because they're always right, know everything. They've, they're all the ones always done wrong because they always did right, and everybody else is, you know, whatever it is. And wisdom's like, what? I, mean, hmm? I thought I heard a flute. Yeah, what now? There was some mourning. I know. I thought it was, but something in me told me to just keep going because I saw that fire in his eyes, and he was going a whole other direction. And he typically never takes me through marketplaces. We don't waste a lot of time. You know, it's beautiful. But wisdom is justified by her children. I love this because it speaks of the feminine side, the recipient end. Um, I have some notes here I wanted to to read off to you, if that's okay. I have here, I love the... Um, how wisdom is justified by, oh, this is another good one. I love um, that how you know wisdom is justified is by watching its life and what it produces and what God is actually entrusting it with versus the opposite of wisdom, always verbalizing how right it is and wrong everyone else is. You notice that foolishness is very verbal and it makes sure it's heard. And wisdom never says a thing. I love that the Lord never even wasted his time in the inherent word of God. You would think if he was going to give the the, um, the the phrase from the foolish against the argument. Sorry, that's what I was looking for or something similar. The argument of the foolish against John the Baptist and Jesus. You would think the Lord in the inherent word of God has got one shot to have this penned by the spirit for all time. He would give the counter, the, the, the countering argument of truth. He didn't waste his time showing you that's what wisdom does. It doesn't waste his time. It doesn't care, not interested, because it's like wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to burn up anyway. And whatever you say about John or Jesus or whoever wisdom is, they don't, they don't care anyway. None of it's going to matter because in eternity it holds no weight. They're dead people, and that's why it's very hard to offend wise people and reject them that they, they're not interested. Like how can you reject somebody that never had any weight in what you thought anyway? They love you because God calls them to, but hate them, love them. That it's not going to really matter. And so I love that Jesus, he, he's so secure because he has wisdom. He gives the argument of the falsified narrative of foolishness and doesn't even give it a rebuttal and counter it. Showing you that's what wisdom does. It is so powerful that in this passage, he shows you what wisdom does. It doesn't even, it lets children justify it. It doesn't justify itself. So wisdom, that's another thing. Number one, not only are you not going to find it in the marketplace, you're not going to hear it. You're going to have to have wisdom yourself by the spirit to, to assess it and, and know by its children that it's already justified because it's not going to waste its time defending itself None of that, whereas, whereas the childlike, by immaturity, not faith, and the foolish, they're always verbalizing. And if we're not careful, this generation can be gullible in buying into anything we've heard, especially with social media and, and YouTube and all this, the hoorah of people saying this and these claims and that. And wisdom is busy away from all that, the noise, just trying to follow Jesus and lay its life down for others, you know. But um, you typically will never hear wisdom boast in its justification. You must just be wise enough yourself to watch the children it produces, both literal and spiritual. Um, yeah, I said this. Wisdom will never justify itself, but allows its children to do that for it. While foolishness lives in a state of perpetual attempts at justifying itself to only convince those that are also foolish because they just call to one another. I love, I was in Isaiah 6 recently. Um, 
and we'll land it and take communion together, I believe for the Lord to be glorified in and through us. I was in Isaiah 6, and I think that's a healthy picture of eternity and what the nearest state of the presence of God in his glory looks like. You have these children, immature, self-centered, unproductive um, men of this generation, uh, men and women, this, this generation that the Lord likens to sitting in the marketplace calling to one another, I played the flute, you didn't you know, dance, I mourned, you didn't care. And then you look at heaven in Isaiah 6, and it says there's these seraphim above the throne. And what's interesting to them is it says that they're calling to one another. Isn't that interesting? Down here, the Lord's like, man, these foolish generations, self-centered, immature, calling to one another. I played the flute. You da, da, da. And then you flip it and go to heaven nearest the throne in the glory of God. And you've got seraphim. The Bible says, read it when you have a chance, Isaiah 6. It says they're calling to one another, just like these children are. But guess what they're calling? It says six wings, two covering their, their eyes, barely peeking through here and there to see the glory of God two covering their feet from the holiness, the other two just to fly. But they're, they're calling to one another, the Bible says. They're not even calling out to God, but they're, they're, here's the seraphim. Let's just say the thrones right here. Seraphim calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. As they see the throne, they're calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. That's what wisdom does. It's constantly got his eyes upon the Lord, and then it calls, wisdom calls to one another, says, holy, holy, holy. Have you seen him? That's what wisdom does. It's too busy not only looking at him, but crying out about him. And where is itself in that scenario? Nowhere. Nowhere do you hear the seraphim say, holy, 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 I'm also amazing, listen to me. Or holy, holy, holy. Did you hear how amazing I said holy? No, I, I'm not in the equation. Wisdom is selfless. And so isn't that a beautiful kind of um, image to see versus the foolishness of mankind we were so caught up on ourselves and we in that low level low caliber um, dimension of foolishness rooted in pride and self-centeredness and uh, immaturity spiritually speaking it calls to one another thinking it's so amazing and want you to recognize it seraphim that come from the presence of god and that's all they know they focus on him and cry out about him and, and that's where you and I need to go. But wisdom, back to wisdom, I love being the uh, depicted as a female, her children. Uh, I have here in my notes, um, and uh, also it says all her children. Imply, and, and man, there's just so much here, it's good. Children also speak of something that is ongoing and lively. It's not one great feat you did five years ago. That's awesome. Praise the God. For, praise the Lord for it. And, and that's that's amazing. Let's do more. But children, I love that it, wisdom is connected to children because they're, it's a living thing that is only growing, deepening, maturing, and it's ongoing. It's not a one-time deal or great feat or something we can say. Remember last year, that one time with God, wisdom is justified by its children. And children are, it's not an exploit, it's a, it's a child, it's a living thing that's ongoing. So wisdom, you can, there's normally history, and it continues, and you can watch it, and it's like, whoa, whoa, and it's all her children. It, you can usually connect it sideways, backward, forward, up and down. It's connected to so many different areas of life. While wisdom's just like, man, I really love Jesus, and I just want to follow him, and all of a sudden it starts producing tr children. But children speak of ongoing living fruit not a one-time feat of an exploit that was awesome that, that god did which we love those let's do more i'm just saying i love that but also um yeah um all implying many children wisdom has many children that it has not only produced but is raising up and tending to oh that's another thing wisdom is 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 too busy tending to its children that it has no time to act like one. And this is why I think we'll title it, I said it earlier, what, what is it? Yeah, be justified by children or act like one. Foolishness is too busy acting like a child to, to be able to even raise any up. But wisdom is so fixated on Jesus Christ, 
he who is wisdom and raising up the children that that wisdom entrusted it with and it doesn't have any time for itself it's tending uh, that's why it's justified by that and doesn't get caught off in all the other stuff but um yeah with absolutely no time to get caught up in the superficial assessments of self-centered childlike ones her i love this wisdom is displayed as a her female also, wisdom is portrayed here as feminine because it is always the recipient of he who is wisdom, the head of wisdom, if you will. She or lady wisdom is always giving birth to the seed of God's voice to and through her. She receives, that, that's the, the female side to it. Lady wisdom is very yielded, pliable, quick to obey um, a vessel that produces the children of his voice. just want to say that again. Lady wisdom is very yielded, meaning it receives. Um, pliable, quick to obey. That female aspect of wisdom that we see here is, is a vessel that produces the children of his voice. They, they do what he says, you know. And, um, you know, even the earth is depicted as a female in, in her in the in the Bible because it, it receives the seed and gives birth. Um, the moon is depicted as feminine because the sun shines on the moon. Well, wisdom is her because it receives the seed of God and gives birth to his voice. And that's the children that it's raising up and justified by and not going to waste its time making sure you know, you know, that they're not interested, not interested. So, Lord, help us. I want to pray, and we'll take communion together. But um, I just love love the Word of God, and, and Jesus is so good to us to be straightforward in these times and so clearly pull the rug out from under foolishness and what it looks like and then leave us a gold bar of wisdom and say, hey, that that's the way you want to go. This is what my kind look like, you know, and um, it will be good. So, Lord, I, I pray. Uh, for each and everyone listening, that uh, you'd help us be be more like you. Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I pray for the spirit of the fear of the Lord that you so delight in, in Isaiah 11, 3. You, de you delight in the fear of the Lord. Um, I think it's Hebrews 5, 7. You, you prayed, Lord Jesus, with loud cries and tears, but you were heard because of your reverence. Lord, help us come back to the reverential awe of God and your word. Um, Isaiah 66, 2, may we tremble at your word. Break off of, of, of us, uh, break off of us any pharisaical and lawyer type tendencies of we know better and, and strong willed um, self centeredness that, that make us unpliable and immovable in a bad way. Lord, make us that soft, tender clay that we can yield unto your word and, and get our focus on you and others. And, and may you never come to us and liken us to this generation that are uh, like children sitting in the marketplaces looking for the attention and thinking they're doing everything right. Nobody else is recognizing and everybody else is wrong. And, and even John the Baptist came set apart, but he's a demon. And son, the son of man comes eating and drinking. He's, a, he's you know, a glutton, wine bibber, in front of tax collectors and sinners. You know, help us lean into the category of wisdom, which you are, and let us be justified by our children. And even that, not so we can be special, but so that you can get glory because this is who you are. This is how you walk. This is how you look. And we want to be like you, that you may be pleased, Lord, I pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Close my iPad and we'll take communion together. And I'd love to pray with you guys. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said uh, in Scripture, that as often as you do this, referring to um, communion, taking the bread and, of his body and the, the wine of his blood, uh, do this in remembrance um, of him. And so I pray right there, hopefully you got something at some point in this recording and you're right there at, at home, whether live, watching it live or, or later. But we'll take communion together. I'll probably move my mic out of the way so I'm not smacking on the cracker in your ear. But... Um, let's just focus on Jesus together for a little bit. I'm, I'm believing, too, that bodies are going to be healed. Um, people are going to be set free by the Spirit of God. I love that the Bible says wherever the Holy Spirit is, there's liberty. 
And I pray for a spirit of truth, too, that will follow this, this uh, communion together. Because the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I pray that deception would be broke off, um, and that truth would come. Healing in bodies, and most importantly, uh, that we'd fall more in love with Jesus, that our heart would become tender to really love and know him, like really love and know him and follow him, you know, in, in, a, in a very cherishable, special way. So let's just focus on Jesus. Lord, we, we love you. Thank you that um, your body was broken and blood shed for us. Perfect Lamb of God. Yeah, you, you you knew no sin but became sin for us. Thank you, Lord, that you you died and rose again on the third day. Even somebody listening, you may say, look, I, I don't even know if I know what you're talking about or fully live for God or know where I'd spend eternity. I want to encourage you to um, surrender your life to, to Jesus Christ even now. He was born of a virgin walked the earth sinless, died and rose again on the third day. And you can confess that and pray that to him in your own home and um, believe in your heart, repent, meaning just turn away from, from the ways of this world and, and your way of thinking even and, and put your trust fully in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But God, I thank you that First Peter 2.24 that says, by your stripes we are uh, healed. Sorry, we were, we were, past tense, speaking to the cross. Isaiah, I think, says are healed, but First Peter, we were healed, past tense, and even now, Lord, as we take your body and your blood, and we thank you, Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord, for all that you've done. I pray that you would be glorified. You'd sweep across the globe in homes and touch bodies and set people free for your glory and capture us again um, uh, in Jesus' name. You may take the, the body and blood. Yeah, right there by faith, you may just want to lift your hands up or just receive by faith. Lord, I thank you for each and every one. And I speak healing right now um, into your homes, could be your office, could be a coffee shop, your car. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I command arthritis to loose you now. Um, cataracts in the eyes be gone. Little tracers be gone. Migraine, he migraine headaches um, be gone. Never return. A cancer, I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ. I love that the Bible says there's life and death in the tongue. And so I use death now from my tongue to speak at cancer, die. And I speak life into your body uh, in Jesus' name. Just receive that. By his stripes you were healed. And Lord, thank you for a fresh conviction of the Holy Spirit and most importantly, um, the the ability to love and know you, a fresh grace to love you, tender, tender, soft hearts to love and know you and fall in love with your word again. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Well, love you guys. Hope that blessed you. Um, we will be back in our live service this next Sunday um, for our church family. A couple of reminders. We have a Corporate Fast coming up May 1st through the 21st. Love for you to join us if you feel led. Um, our table nights. Next one is this coming Wednesday. Going to be a blast. Just eating food, becoming family together, loving each other. And um, I think that's it for now on announcements. But love you guys. Um, may we fall more in love with Jesus uh, now, now more than ever before uh, for his glory. And uh, we'll catch you next time.